number one, Nazis are bad people. And number two, they are bad people that are also bad at making films. Hello and welcome. I'm Ashley and this is Beauty Biography. Every Friday we explore the life of an iconic beauty while creating an inspired makeup look. I like to think of it as like old school biography channel meets my love of makeup. So if that sounds like fun to you, let me sure to hit the thumbs up button and also hit the subscribe button so that you will see new beauty biography videos pop up in your YouTube subscription feed. Today we are exploring the life of one of the best actresses of all time, Ingrid Bergman. I grew up watching old classic Hollywood movies on like the Turner AMC channel with my parents. So I have for years equated the name Ingrid Bergman with just great films, great acting, sheer talent. But what I didn't know was that that just your acting ability was actually born out of a coping strategy for a very traumatic and lonely childhood. Ingrid took the pain and trauma of a childhood filled with abandonment and turned it into an incredible and unrivaled career. Let's dive in. Ingrid is born on August 29th, 1915 in Stockholm, Sweden. She is named after Princess Ingrid of Sweden, who was at the time five years old. Ingrid was a Virgo and she displays a lot of stereotypical Virgo traits. She is hardworking, she's practical, and she's also very sure of her self-identity. Ingrid's father, his name is Justice Bergman, and he owned a very successful camera shop in Stockholm. He was one of the first people in Sweden to own a movie camera. and. In Ingrid's early childhood, he was constantly taking photos and videos of her, so she grew up very comfortable in front of the camera. Ingrid's mother, Frida Adler, was from Germany, and she had a quite kind of like cold and stern disposition, so she contrasted Ingrid's father a lot in that regard, just in her temperament. And quite sadly, when Ingrid is only three years old, her mother dies of gallbladder disease. Now, Ingrid was the only one of three children that her parents had that survived past infancy. So, so when Ingrid's mother passes, it's just Ingrid and her father now. She becomes very dependent on her father because that is her really only source of attachment now as a small child. And children, like, they have to have attachment. They have, like, it's a survival mechanism. When you're a child, you feel attached to the people that care for you. It's your entire survival is very dependent on it. So she obviously becomes extremely attached to her father because she's lost her mother and that abandonment is really hard on a small child. Ingrid's aunt Ellen Bergman moves in with her and her father, but her aunt Ellen is really not super great with children. She's similar to Ingrid's mom. She's very kind of stern. She's a very conservative Lutheran. She just is not, you know, she's not playing with a small child the way that small children really want to be played with. And as a result of this, Ingrid kind of from a very early age develops a very complex world of imaginary friends and characters that she herself plays. She puts on these skits that she improvises for her father so that she can feel not alone. This is really her solace, this kind of imaginary world that she creates and acts out. Even as a child, Ingrid knew she wanted to be an actress. She once wrote in her diary, Dear God, please let me be an actress. She really wanted to act, which contrasts a little bit with the fact that she's quite shy in school. She is very introverted. She doesn't really play with the other children very much. She doesn't develop any close friendships as a child with anyone her age. And that's not really... I think that sometimes people think that all actors and actresses and performers must be very extroverted. And that's just not the case. That's two completely different things. Your personality and the profession and passion you have in life are two very different things. People can be introverted and be actors. It's completely possible and it is the case for Ingrid. By the time Ingrid is 13, she is 
five foot nine inches and she hates school because she feels very awkward, very lonely. She's taller than the other children. She just doesn't feel as though she fits in. And you know, she's gone through a lot in her life and quite sadly, right before she turns 14, she suffers another loss when her father dies of stomach cancer. So Ingrid is now an orphan at the age of 14. Ingrid moves in with her Aunt Ellen, the aunt we were talking about earlier, the very conservative Lutheran, but six months after Ingrid moves in with her, Ingrid's Aunt Ellen dies in Ingrid's arms. So she has suffered unimaginable loss by the time she's 15 years old. Ingrid moves in with another relative and she becomes completely depressed. She just withdraws completely from anyone else. She doesn't want to talk to peers. She doesn't want to hang out with friends. She doesn't really even have friends because she's been moving around so much and she feels very alone. So she retreats even further into her make-believe world that she's created and these roles that she's created for herself. And her favorite role to play when she was, you know, creating these little plays and skits on her own was St. Joan of Arc. She really related to her. When Ingrid is 15, she gets a role as an extra in a Swedish film. And this kind of helps bring Ingrid out of the depression she's in because she feels like she has taken a step towards her goal of becoming a very accomplished and successful actress. In 1933, Ingrid is 18 years old and she auditions for the Royal Dramatic Theater School, which is one of the premier theater schools, drama schools in Europe, and she is accepted. So she is on her way. While she's in school, Ingrid gets a small role in a Swedish movie and her performance gets very good reviews. So she decides she's going to withdraw from theater school and she's going to go into film. Her instructors try to stop her because they kind of feel that at this time they feel like that's selling out. She's gonna be selling herself short. She's so talented. She belongs in the theater where she can showcase her incredible talent and they just don't want her to sell out. So they really implore her to stay in theater school, but Ingrid, she doesn't wanna hear it. She's very sure of herself. She knows what she wants to do and she decides to withdraw from school and begin acting in films in Sweden. And by 1936, she is one of the most successful, widely known actresses in Sweden. At this point, Ingrid is also now dating Peter Lindstrom. He is a dentist, a Swedish dentist, and she's very drawn to him. He's 10 years older than her, and she feels like the stability he has is very, that's very attractive to her. As someone who has gone through losing so many people, she lost a father figure that was so important to her, so the age difference is a little bit comforting to her, and she's just very in love and very sure that she wants to be with Peter. So much so that she begins, you know, asking him for career advice because I guess, you know, obviously dentists know a lot about the film industry. Joking. But Peter actually does have some good ideas. Peter tells Ingrid, you know, to stand out as an actress, we need to, you know, play up the fact that you are such a very natural and fresh beauty. That's what's going to set you apart. He, he realizes this very quickly. And so he actually kind of has this like scheme that he comes up with for Ingrid where anytime Ingrid needs to go to the studio in Stockholm, the studio is on the edges of Stockholm. So they have to drive out there and he decides, you know what, anytime you need to go out there for an audition or an interview, here's what we're going to do. And they would get in the car, drive almost all the way there. And then when they were about like half a mile away from the studio, he would have Ingrid get out of the car, take her bike out of the trunk, or maybe Swedes call it the boot. I don't know. Actually, they speak Swedish, so it would be a Swedish word. Anyway, so he has her get her bike out of the back of the car and she would bike the rest of the way, the last half mile, so that when she would arrive, she would be, you know, flesh, like flushed and fresh faced and her hair would be a little bit wind tossed. And, you know, the studio executives were like, wow, she's just so fresh faced and natural and she's just riding her bicycle here, <laughs> which obviously she had not, but they didn't know that. So 
well, Peter had some good ideas. In the summer of 1936, Peter and Ingrid are engaged and they travel to Germany to visit Ingrid's maternal aunt. And when they get there, they find out that her aunt has become a really big supporter of the NSDAP, which if you did not know, uh, that's the Nazi party. Uh, Peter's not down with this. Peter is not down with this. He's disgusted. He's pretty much horrified. I mean, can you imagine like you go to visit your fiance's aunt and oh, surprise, she's a Nazi. Ingrid, on the other hand, well, Ingrid has very little family left and she wants to keep her aunt because she's lost basically everyone else in her family. So she's a little more sympathetic. Not a good idea. Never a good idea. Save your sympathy for someone other than Nazis. Ingrid really wants things to stay on good terms with her aunts, and pretty soon she's throwing out some Heil Hitler salutes. Oi, Gewalt. It's important to note that it is 1936, and Ingrid seemingly was really not aware of how far the Nazi party was going to take some things, um, but it does get worse. The next year in 1937, after Ingrid and Peter are married, Ingrid signs a three film deal with UFA, which is a Nazi controlled German film studio. Ingrid makes one film with the fascists and then I guess is surprised to find out that number one, Nazis are bad people. And number two, they are bad people that are also bad at making films. Ingrid only makes the one film with the UFA and then she bows out of her contract. She would for the rest of her life feel quite guilty about the fact that she missed the signs on this and she will later try to make amends for this. So she makes the one movie and then she goes back to Sweden where she gives birth to her first child, a daughter named Pia in September of 1938. As mentioned earlier, Ingrid is one of the most well-known actresses in Sweden and the most successful film that she has been in at this point was a film called Intermezzo that premiered in 1936. The film was very successful across Europe, and when producer David O. Selznick, who will later become most well-known for producing Gone with the Wind, when he sees the film, he immediately buys the rights to make an American English language version, and he wants Ingrid to reprise her role in this English version. Ingrid, by the way, is a polyglot, so she spoke natively growing up she spoke both Swedish and German. She then learned French and English and she would later in life go on to learn Italian and she would make movies in all five of these languages. So she was very impressive, very intelligent. In the spring of 1939, Ingrid gets on the Queen Mary ship to travel to Hollywood where she is going to star in the English version of Intermesso. And when she gets there, the first night she's in Hollywood, she has a meeting with David O. Selznick. And he immediately says to her something that's not gonna surprise anyone who's watched one of these beauty biography videos. He says, all right, we're gonna change your name. We're gonna change your teeth. We're gonna change your eyebrows. Good luck with that, David. Ingrid, quite, this is a quite famous anecdote. Ingrid stands up, Ingrid? Ingrid stands up and says, we've both made a terrible mistake. I thought you wanted Ingrid Bergman. Obviously you want someone else. I am Ingrid Bergman. I will be Ingrid Bergman. If you don't want Ingrid Bergman, then I will go back to Sweden where I will continue my career as Ingrid Bergman. And good for her. She's very sure in her identity. This is someone who obviously, I mean, she's known since she was young. She wants to be a great actress. And when she, in her mind, that idea of success is not, oh, I want to be a bombshell. It is, I want to play great parts. I want to give great performances. I want to be known for my acting chops. And I think a big part of her issue with David O. Selznick is him throwing out this idea of changing her name, which is you know, that's part of her identity. And she was very close with her father and then lost him. So how dare this guy over here think he's gonna tell Ingrid Bergman, no, you gotta drop Bergman. No, you're not gonna get that over with Ingrid Bergman. And I have to tell you, I really truly feel like this is such a Virgo trait because the Virgos in my life are some of the most self-assured people. They know who they are and that's who they are. 
you're not gonna change them. So Selznick is quite shocked, but he's like, you know what? All right, don't worry, Ingrid. I, I have a great idea. I am gonna market you as like the natural, fresh, you know, fresh faced beauty from Sweden. And he realizes, you know what, that'll be a really great contrast to all the other female stars of the time who are quite, you know, made up. So he, he realizes quite quickly, all right, we're not going to change Ingrid Bergman. So let's just market Ingrid Bergman for what she is, this beautiful, natural beauty who is just raw talent. Ingrid films the English version of Intermezzo and everyone who works with her is blown away. Number one, she's insanely talented. And number two, she's always on time. She always knows her lines. She's very agreeable to work with. She's very polite to everyone. She is just a joy to work with. So Ingrid wraps up filming and she returns to Sweden and everything is not great. There's a pretty big wedge in her marriage with Peter because when Ingrid left to go film Intermezzo, she left Peter and their daughter who was six months old at the time that Ingrid left. So this has caused, pretty understandably, it's caused a little bit of a rift in the marriage. But Peter kind of sets that aside because at this point, World War II was underway in Europe and Peter is thinking, okay, we've got to think about what's best to keep our family safe. So he he tells Ingrid, you know what, you need to take Pia and you need to go back to Hollywood because it is safer there than it is in Europe. Ingrid agrees and she returns to Hollywood with Pia. Intermezzo premieres, it's a huge success and David O. Selznick gives Ingrid another contract. Now three films under this contract are released in 1941. They are Adam Had Four Sons, Rage in Heaven, and most notably, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I say most notably because in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Ingrid plays against type, which means she plays a role that would not be the natural role that you would just stereotypically think of for her. They originally wanted her to play the the kind of good girl character, which is Dr. Jekyll's fiance, but she really begs them. She's like, no, I want the more challenging role. I want the meteor role. And that is the role of Ivy, who is a sex working barmaid. The studio gives in and they let Ingrid play Ivy. And this really shows her range. So this is a pivotal moment in her career. The same year, 1941, Ingrid's husband, Peter, is admitted to the University of Rochester's medical school in upstate New York. So Pia and Peter move to upstate New York and Ingrid joins them whenever she, you know, has a break in work. She actually has one period of unemployment that lasts for eight months. And it's said that Ingrid kind of goes into a depression about this. She likes to be working. That's her passion. It's her purpose. And without it, she feels very rudderless and she has a hard time coping. But alas, it is always darkest before the dawn. And this period of unemployment ends when Ingrid is offered the role of Ilsa Lund in Casablanca. Ingrid was a little hesitant about playing Ilsa at first. When she reads the first script, she feels like Ilsa is kind of not well thought out, thought out enough. She doesn't feel like the role is really fleshed out as well as it could be. And she shares these notes with the director and the producers and they, they make some edits to Ilsa based on Ingrid's notes, which is fantastic. Good thing they did, right? Right. While filming, there's a lot of indecision on the set, so much so that Ingrid said they actually made the actors film two different endings because they were not sure how they were going to actually end the film. Ingrid said that pretty much no one on set felt like they were making a classic because things were so hectic and kind of indecisive. But obviously, Casablanca turns out to be a huge critical and box office success, and not to mention, a just evergreen film legend. In <laughs> uh, this film, it catapults Ingrid's career into a completely new stratosphere. So in 1943, Ingrid and Pia and Peter as well all move to Hollywood, but things aren't going super fantastic. At this point, Peter and Ingrid are kind of caught in like a marriage of convenience. Peter has for many years been kind of Ingrid's de facto manager. He has helped her figure out kind of all of her contracts. He's reviewed that stuff, helped her make business decisions. And 
she's kind of just comfortable in that and that's pretty much all that's holding them together. 1943 will also see Ingrid play Maria in For Whom the Bell Tolls, which was a film adaptation of the Ernest Hemingway novel, which is one of my very favorites. For this role, Ingrid will receive her very first Academy Award nomination. The following year in 1943, the film Gaslight is released. In this film, Ingrid plays Paula, who is a woman that has been psychologically manipulated by her husband into believing that she is going insane. If you've ever heard the term gaslighting, it actually originated from the play that this film is based on. It is, I highly recommend if you have never seen that movie, go watch it. It's it's so ahead of its time to think that this, I mean, it literally catapults this manipulation technique, this form of psychological abuse that is now part of like our day-to-day -day vernacular. It, it literally sets it up to where that becomes part of our just normal speech, like gaslighting. Most people know what that is. And the film, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. Critics agree, and Ingrid receives her first Academy Award for her portrayal of Paula. In 1945, Ingrid stars in two very big films in her career, The Bells of St. Mary's and Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound. The Bells of St. Mary's is actually the biggest box office hit of 1945. Ingrid plays a nun in it, and she is so convincing in her portrayal of this nun that her fans kind of start to conflate her, Ingrid the person, with her roles. And a lot of her fans start to see her as being a nun, like a saint, like Saint Ingrid. Uh, this is gonna come back to bite her later on. Not yet, but soon enough. Ingrid receives her third straight Academy Award nomination for her role in The Bells of St. Mary's. And in Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound, it is said that while on set, Alfred Hitchcock fell madly in love with Ingrid. She did not fall in love with him back, but she did respect him and care for him and they will actually become lifelong friends. Ingrid would go on to star in two more Hitchcock films, Notorious opposite Cary Grant, which is one of her most critically acclaimed performances and Under Capricorn, which would premiere in 1949. In October of 1946, Ingrid finally gets the chance to play the role that she loved to play most as a child, Joan of Arc. She gets this opportunity when she stars in the play Joan of Lorraine, which is premiering on Broadway. This has a 12 week run and it is a huge success. There are fans lined up every night after the play. They're lined up every night to talk to Ingrid. They want autographs. They just are in love with her. The Associated Press names Ingrid the Woman of the Year. Gallup certifies her as the most popular actress in America, and Ingrid wins a Tony for her performance in this play. In 1948, this play is adapted into the film Joan of Arc, and Ingrid once again stars as Saint Joan. She does receive an Academy Award nomination for this role, but the film is, it's a flop. Critics don't like it and it flops at the box office in large part because shortly after the film hits theaters, Ingrid becomes immersed, embroiled, if you will, in her first big scandal. What scandal, you ask? Well, shortly after the premiere of Joan of Arc, Ingrid uh, leaves Peter and Pia in Hollywood to go to Italy to film the movie Stromboli with Italian director Roberto Rossellini. Uh, shortly after she gets to Italy, the papers, the press, break this huge story that Ingrid is having an affair with Roberto Rossellini. People have thought of Ingrid as the saint, Saint Joan, uh, this beautiful nun in the Bells of St. Mary's and now she's having an affair with an Italian right after World War II? <laughs> Not good. People are, they are really upset. They had one image of her that they really had in their head. They had conflated her with her characters and now she has failed to meet the impossible standard that they have set for her because obviously she's just a human. To make matters worse, a few months into filming, Ingrid writes Peter and says, you know what, I'm not coming back. I'm gonna stay here in Italy with Roberto and Ingrid, you have a daughter. You have a daughter. 
don't do this, Ingrid. But she does. Peter flies to Italy. He tries to work things out with Ingrid. She's just not hearing it in part because, unbeknownst to Peter, Ingrid is pregnant with Roberto Mussolini's child, which, yeah, when that hits the press, which it does, it does, things only get worse. You thought it was bad before? Oh, no, no, now it's out of control. The scandal is so huge at this point that Ingrid is actually vilified on the floor of the U.S. Senate, where a senator says, and I quote, that Ingrid has perpetuated an assault upon the institution of marriage. I don't understand that. I've never kind of understood why someone else, you know, messing up their marriage would have anything to do with my marriage. I personally don't think it does, but, you know, it was a time like McCarthyism was big and people really, really wanted to judge other people. I mean, some people still do want to judge other people, which again, I don't understand, but I guess I won't judge you for it. This is a terrible time for Ingrid, quite obviously. Being publicly shamed is awful. Her divorce with Peter is terrible. Peter ends up getting full custody of Pia and it will actually be eight years before Ingrid sees Pia again. So there's an eight year stretch where she does not see her daughter, which is really terrible. Adding insult to injury, when the film Stromboli is released in 1950, it's a flop. No one wants to see it. They don't want to see the product of this scandal. And a lot of like women's clubs and service clubs, women's groups have basically decided, no, we are boycotting Ingrid Bergman. and. A lot of Americans agree, and they, they don't want to see Ingrid anymore. She has fallen from grace in an extremely public and heartbreaking way. There is a positive note, though. In the same month that Stromboli is released, Ingrid gives birth to a son who they nickname Robin. Three months after giving birth, her divorce from Peter is final, and she marries Roberto Rossellini. They will go on to have two more children, twin girls named Ingrid and Isabella in 1952. Ingrid tries very hard to make her marriage with Roberto Rossellini work. She really wants things to work out. They have three children together and she's, she's trying very hard. Her and Roberto collaborate a good deal together during their marriage, but none of the films are successful and Ingrid does not like the way that Roberto works. She's very disciplined, very professional, and Roberto kind of likes to like do things on the fly. He's very impulsive in his work. He's also very impulsive in life. He's not good at managing money and she, he kind of gets them into debt. He also is very jealous of how talented and how big of a star Ingrid is. This tension in their marriage comes to a head in 1956 when Ingrid stars in a French production of the play tea and sympathy. Roberto Rossellini is very mad that Ingrid is doing work that's not work with him. He's mad about that and he tells her, you know, the play is trash, Ingrid. It is trash and people are going to boo you off the stage, which wow, way to be a supportive husband, Roberto. That's, that's how you do it. There's an incredible anecdote where Ingrid tells her dear friend, and he repeats this story in an interview I watched, that when the play premiered on opening night, Roberto was in Ingrid's dressing room. And when she came back to her dressing room after the first act, he asked her, is anyone still there? Like, oh, have they not left yet? Because your play is so bad. <laughs> she goes back out, she acts the second half. And when she comes back from acting the second half, he says, are they throwing tomatoes at you yet? And she says, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm busy acting. <laughs> She goes back out for the third act. She finishes the, the play. The third act is the final act. And at the end of the third act, she receives a 14-minute standing ovation. And she told her friend, I looked into the wings. I saw Roberto's face. And I knew my marriage is over. He was so jealous of her talent and her success. He just, he couldn't handle it. Ingrid and Roberto begin a nasty divorce battle. It will not be finalized until 1957, but it will end with Roberto getting custody of their three children. Later in 1956, Ingrid stars in the film Anastasia. The film producers are initially very worried about casting her because of her scandal. They're not sure if audiences are ready to forgive Ingrid, but they take the chance and 
it's great that they do because she absolutely blows the film out of the water. Her performance is incredible and this is Ingrid's comeback. The movie is a box office hit. It's critically acclaimed and it garners her her second Academy Award. She wins and Cary Grant accepts the award on her behalf, which funny enough, he also accepted Sophia Loren's Academy Award. So what was Cary Grant doing back then? He was just like hanging out at the Oscars, accepting everybody's awards that couldn't be there. Interesting. So Ingrid is back and she is better than ever. She begins a romance with a Swedish producer named Lars Schmidt. They have a lot in common because he is Swedish. So they have kind of, you know, that background to tie them together. He's very even tempered. He's very kind. And they go on to marry in December of 1958. Ingrid reestablishes a relationship with her daughter, Pia. Things never become completely perfect between them, but they do, they do make amends. And she also goes to Italy quite frequently, travels there quite frequently to see her three children that she has with Roberto Rossellini because they do live with Roberto in Italy. As Ingrid gets older, she continues to appear in films and plays. A couple of the more notable ones are Indiscreet with Cary Grant in 1958 and the play More Stately Mansions in 1967, which is just, that play is a huge success and it's very popular with other people in Hollywood actually with her peers. Alfred Hitchcock comes to the premiere to see her. She will actually later go on to host an event that AFI holds honoring Alfred Hitchcock for lifetime achievement. So she's continuing to work and she's continuing to be successful in acting, which is her purpose and her passion. But unfortunately, her relationship with Lars, it just doesn't end up working out and they divorce amicably and quietly in 1975. Ingrid would later say that she always was very upfront with her husbands that they were going to come second to acting. Acting was her passion. That was her number one. And they were going to have to take a back seat to that. And it turns out that none of her husbands liked that. I do think that it makes quite a lot of sense that Ingrid chose to put her work first because when you think about it, she had so much loss in her early life and acting was really that was the world that she immersed herself in was this kind of fantasy world that she made in her head with these skits and these characters. And that was the only thing she had that couldn't leave her, you know, that couldn't, that couldn't pass away. It couldn't abandon her. And that purpose was integral to who she was because it was the one consistent thing that she had her entire life. I understand why she did not want to give that up and why she would not be open to someone taking that away from her. In May of 1974, Ingrid is diagnosed with breast cancer. She undergoes a mastectomy and she keeps this very tight. She keeps this very guarded. She only tells people in her close circle. She does not want to go through this publicly. It's just not her nature. She continues to work in theater and in film and at the 1975 Academy Awards, she receives her third Academy Award when she wins Best Supporting Actress for her role in Murder on the Orient Express. In 1976, Ingrid was the first person to receive France's newly created Honorary César, which is a national film award. She is 62 when she films the movie Autumn Sonata, which becomes a very, a very big role in her career because it is one, her last film, and number two, it's a very personal role for Ingrid. In the film, she plays a very talented, famous pianist who is trying to reconnect with the daughter that she kind of abandoned for her career. And this is very reflective of Ingrid's life and her relationship with Pia. And this causes her to really have to look inwardly and do some difficult work to come to terms with reconciling the fact that she she did have to kind of sacrifice her relationship with her daughter to succeed and to have the career that she had. Ingrid receives her seventh and final Academy Award nomination for her role in Autumn Sonata, 
but sadly while filming she finds out that her cancer has spread. Ingrid is in a lot of pain. Doctors supposedly tell her that she needs to have her arm amputated because the cancer has spread there. She refuses and three years after filming Autumn Sonata she flies to Israel for her final role playing Golda Meir in the TV miniseries A Woman Called Golda. Ingrid had initially turned down the role because Golda Meir, if you did not know, was the Israeli Prime Minister and Ingrid was worried that number one, she was much taller than Golda uh, and also that she was a Swede and how is she going to do justice to such a pivotal role in Israeli and Jewish culture. She's not sure she can do that, but ultimately as she researches Golda's life, she sees some similarities between herself and Golda. Golda was very driven and very sure of herself, much like Ingrid. She sacrificed family and children for her career, much like Ingrid. And Golda also suffered from cancer. Ingrid has been suffering from cancer for eight years at this point, and she is in pain, great pain, almost daily. Despite this, she dedicates herself completely to the role of Golda. She sees this as a chance to make amends for the film that she did in Nazi Germany, and she throws herself into the role. She never complains. She never tells anyone that she's not feeling well. She really, up until the very end, was herself. Agreeable to work with, dedicated to what she was doing, and very in love with her purpose, which was acting. Four months after filming raps on a woman called Golda, Ingrid passes away on her 67th birthday from complications related to cancer. She wins an Emmy Award posthumously for her role as Golda Meir, and her daughter Pia accepts the award on her behalf. Her third husband, Lars, had long ago made a promise to Ingrid that when she passed away he would scatter her ashes in the sea and he does follow through with this promise. Ingrid aspired to be remembered as a great actress and she is. She earned that and she deserved it. In 2015, to celebrate the centennial of Ingrid Bergman's birth, exhibitions, film screenings, books, documentaries, and seminars were presented by various museums and universities across the world, including the Museum of Modern Art, which held a screening of Ingrid Bergman's films that were chosen and introduced by her children. I think the best way to honor Ingrid's legacy is with Ingrid's own words. Ingrid once said, and I quote, I have no regrets. I wouldn't have lived my life the way I did if I was going to worry about what people were going to say. Well, Ingrid, my dear, I don't think you have to worry at all about what anyone would say because you were simply one of the best. I thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with me today. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Beauty Biography. Let me know in the comments, do you know any fun facts about Ingrid that I missed? I would love for you to share those down below. You can also let me know who you'd like to see in the next edition of Beauty Biography. I hope to see you then. These come out every Friday, so make sure that you've hit the subscribe button so that you can see me next week. Until then, you take care of yourself. Bye.